Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Jeff King. I'm the president of International Christian Concern. Um, <clears throat> been in the, in the persecution business for about 20 years. I want to tell you a story. About 20 years ago, or a long time ago, there was a, a country in North Africa, and there was a major outbreak of persecution. And what they did, in fact, the government, what they did was they rounded up all the evangelical leaders, uh, the, the pastors of the largest churches, and they said, listen, we've got a deal for you. Uh, we're going to shut down your churches. We're going to put you in prison, and we're going to fine you multiple years of salary. And so I brought one of these gentlemen over, and we did, you know, it's kind of a standard tour on Capitol Hill. And so we're talking to senators and congressmen and the State Department and USERF and all the, the usual the usual suspects. And this guy was a, a very effective guest. He was he had a quiet charisma and high trust and very effective. I was, I was really impressed with this guy. And he goes back, and he's, two weeks later, he sends me an email. And in this email, I've saved it to this day because it was just amazing. He says, you're not going to believe it. The same guys that rounded us up, he said, they brought us all back together. And they said, listen, we know someone's been talking in Washington. And we just want you to know that you never need to go to Washington. If there's a problem, you just come see us. You know, we're all brothers. We're all family. So they said there's no charges. The, the churches are open. Um, and there's no fines. And that was the end of the problem for about 10 years or so until the next round. Um, but you fast forward, and I fast forward to 20 years later now, and we, we look around the world, and we look at, at the, the picture of persecution, and what do we see? Has it gotten better? It's not gotten better, has it? Look at the Middle East. My gosh, what's happened to the plight of traditional Christians in the Middle East, it's, uh, Iraq especially? Uh, what's happened in Nigeria? You know, it's a slow-moving genocide. It's a massive land grab. What's happened in Western democracies? Um, it's not getting better. It's getting worse. Um, and, you know, if there's one thing, when I look back on that story I told you, now, I was very early in my career, so I thought I was the only one working on the case, and I didn't really understand how the advocacy thing worked, and I was like, my gosh, advocacy sure is easy. And uh, we all know that's not the case at all, right? It's, it's a complicated game, and that's kind of a, a home run story. But if there's a lesson with advocacy, it's the power of working together, right? I think we all know that. Um, but when you look around the, the persecution going around the world and even now visited in the democracies in our own country, what's happening to Christians? Who's being affected? Well, it's the Coptics, it's the Catholics, it's evangelicals, Orthodox, it's the body of Christ, right? Um, and the problems are way too large for any one organization. And, you know, my organization represents a, a drop in the water of, of the body of Christ of Christendom. And whether it's organizations or denominations or individuals, but I'm just struck by the power of the group. You know, Benjamin Franklin uh, famously said that we've got to hang together. And if we don't hang together, we're going to hang individually and we're going to hang separately so my organization, again, is just a drop in the ocean. And yet together, Coptic and all of us, we represent an ocean. And on the ocean, there are waves. And with waves, we can send a wave of pressure to countries. We can send a wave of pressure politically. We can make a difference by hanging together. So with that, that's why I'm so excited to be here. I'm so excited to be uh, connected with Coptic Solidarity. We've worked uh, together for a long time. So thank you to President Doss, to Adele, Magdi, um, and uh, uh, Advocacy Director Lindsay, uh, pleasure to be here. We're going to be talking today uh, about Iraq and about Sudan and about Nigeria. And I think what we're going to do, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to do my best to introduce our guests because <laughs> one of them, we're not going to say who they are. Uh, but in general, let me introduce our guests, and then uh, we can kind of go through the countries, and we'll have about ten minutes for each speaker. And I don't have the power of the mic here. I wish I had a kill switch, but we're going to do our best. We're going to try to do 10 minutes each. And then at the end, we can do some Q&A. Sound like a plan? All righty. So um, not in any order, but sitting next to me uh, is Simisola Okai. And she's a native of Nigeria and a country that is deeply on my heart. Um, a Master of Arts degree from Regent University, TV producer, presenter, author, 
author of I Want to Be a Mommy When I Grow Up, Lessons of Faith and Hope, Waiting for the Ice Cream Man, um, and has a lot of great insight into what's going on in Nigeria. Uh, Sudan, we have a guest that's unnamed for security reasons. Uh, and then finally, oh, my brother, where are you in my notes? There you are. I'm our Rahima. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Thank you for your patience. So, okay, why don't we start, um, since I don't know what's going on with the situation with Sudan, I know it's a little touchy with our speaker, but uh, Simi Solo, why don't you talk to us, first of all, just kind of give us a general uh, idea of what's going on, what's happened in Nigeria over the last 20 years, and then, and then go broader and go into your details. I was born in Jos, Nigeria. Is it? Is, it, is this better? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, well, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of my beloved country, Nigeria. Um, I was born in Jos, Nigeria. Oh, I was born in Lagos, but I grew up in Jos, Nigeria. And so that's the middle belt. And so this persecution of Christians has been going on for even before I was born, yeah. just years and years of persecution. And it really breaks my heart what is happening to my people. And so um, it's my honor to really speak up for those who cannot speak up for themselves. And I think sometimes we need to have faces and names. And so I want to speak up for people like Leah Sharibu. Mm -hmm. um, she was captured at 14 and she's still in captivity. Six years later, she's 20, um, because of her refusal to deny her faith. Uh, I wanna speak up for Alice Ngada. She's a married woman and a mother, uh, a UNICEF nurse. She's still in captivity and she has not seen her children in five years. And as a mother, you know, I have three children, I cannot imagine um, that devastation. I speak up for Lillian Yang, She's a former zoology student in Maiduguri. And she was captured and sold into slavery in 2020. And also for Praise Austin, who was kidnapped after a youth service on her way to Maiduguri. And there's hundreds of, of cases um, like this of people captured because of their Christian faith, persecuted every day. And, and, and it's personal for me as well. You know, growing up in Joss, Nigeria, in 2001, Joss. Um, which is the capital of Plateau State in central Nigeria, became a place of mass killing and destruction. And hundreds of people were killed. Tens of thousands were displaced in less than one week. So you can imagine everything that's happening, even taking place right now. Uh, my husband was born in Kaduna in the north. Um, that's the northern part of G Nigeria where a lot of persecution is taking place. Um, it was so intense um, that... His cousin, he went to work one day, and to his horror, when he came home, he found that his wife and children had been burned in their own home. This is my husband's cousin. So these cases are real. It's not just something in the news, something people talk about. It's happening all because of people's faith in Christ. And so, you know, as we know, terrorist groups have done unspeakable acts of evil. They've um, rapes, killings, kidnappings, pillaging, taking Christians hostage, killing innocent lives. And they've also taken away the economic power of Christians, including burning down Christian schools, churches, and organizations that belong to Christians. And this is happening today as we speak. And so I, I'm grateful for the international community, especially organizations like Coptic Solidarity, that they're making this a priority for discourse. I think that's very important. Um, and I'm also calling for attackers and the perpetrators to be held accountable for their actions. Um, I'm calling for the international community to do something to help the villages and the communities that have been uprooted and displaced. And many of them have lost their source of livelihood. And you know, sometimes we, we need to speak to someone who's, spoke, who's either interacted or um, interacted with someone on the ground and, and what has taken place. And so I'm a TV producer and I've covered many stories about the ongoing crisis. And one person in particular um, that stands out to me is a courageous woman. Her name uh, is Lamie John. 
she's from Goza, my Duguri. And she described to me, I was, I was in Nigeria, you know, producing this story, and she, she talked about what happened to her. Basically, insurgents came shooting guns into their village. They captured hundreds of Nigerians, about 279 is what she said, including her husband and children. And they were held hostage against their will. They were starved. They were tortured. They were also lined up one by one and asked to deny their faith in Jesus Christ. They were asked to either deny their faith or face death. And so Lami, she's a courageous woman, she refused. She would not deny her faith in Christ, and she was sliced in the neck. Fortunately, she survived. Her husband, however, did not. And so before her eyes, he was shot to death, and he was set on fire. And so th these are kind of some of the stories, the things that people are living, you know, just talking to her. It was just devastating to hear that and to see it in her eyes, her sadness, Fortunately, she told me that it was prayer, and she had she hit a Bible with her, and she said that's what saved her life. Basically, she was able to narrowly escape by the grace of God. She said she it was at nighttime, and she was able to get a pin and unlock herself. Uh, the insurgents were asleep, and she escaped and was running in the bushes for days um, to her freedom. And that's just one of the cases. Um, that has happened. She's told me that she's since chosen to forgive her perpetrators. I also produced a story by uh, a Nigerian UNICEF emergency worker. His name is Soji Adeniyi. He was the victim of a bomb attack uh, by insurgents. And you know, many of you may know about this, but this took place at the UN headquarters in the building in Abuja in Nigeria um, in 2011. And I've spoken one-on-one -on -one with Reverend Gideon Paramalam. He's a global missions leader of over 30 years, and he's been involved in advocacy for the persecuted church under Paramalam Peace Foundation. He can verify each of these accounts. I also have close family members and friends who have been kidnapped. My family and loved ones in Nigeria live under the fear of these threats every day. And stories like this are happening Every day, they're far too common, far too common. And there are people in captivity right now, even some of the ones I named, who are waiting for us to do something, to say something, to hold the perpetrators accountable, to do all that is in our power to set them free from captivity. And so I feel that we must rise to the occasion. And I want to close with a verse from Micah 6.8. And it says this, he has told you, mankind, what is good. What does the Lord require of you except to carry out justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I so enjoyed that, Simi Sol, because especially in Washington, you know, I think so often what's lost is the story of the individual. So we deal with statistics and we deal with very large numbers. And in, in Nigeria, we're dealing with very large numbers. So it's wonderful to get those stories out and remember that these, these are uh, victims. And each victim, there's a, a massive wave of pain that goes out from the loss of them. Um, and let me lay out some figures for you and tell me if this rings true from what you understand. So no one really knows the, the real number, but uh, since the turn of the century, uh, the victims are probably 70 to 100,000 Christians killed. Sound right? Yeah. And uh, then there's the massive depopulation where the massive land grab, and really that's a lot of what this is about, and it's a Muslim land grab. Um, and then we're looking at 3 million plus Christian farmers. Does that sound right? Yes. I, yeah. can't, I can't verify numbers, but I know yeah. it's... It's a massive number. It's a massive number. Yeah. Um, and just to give you the scale of, of what's happened, and it's infuriating because in Washington, um, you know, in the advocacy game, it goes like this. You know, you try to, what, you know, I, I feel this issue so intensely, and I'm always standing up for Nigeria. Um, and what happens is successive administrations in Nigeria come to Washington. They say, my gosh, this is such a complicated problem. 
you know, it's herders and farmers, and you guys had trouble with herders and farmers, and um, and gosh, these guys are guerrilla fighters. They're out in the bush. We can't find them. If you could give us more military aid, I'm sure that would help. And But boy, oh boy, we're doing our best. We're going to get on this thing. So that's the continual speech. Now, that's gone on for 20 years. And imagine any country in the world, imagine the United States, you've got a, a, a group of victims, um, you know, let's say half a million victims. And the government says, I'm sorry, we're doing our best, but we just can't find these people. They're hiding in the forest. It's ludicrous. And what's going on is, look, in, in Nigeria, all the, all the security services are run by Muslims. And so that's the intel agencies, that's the police, uh, that's the military, and that's why nothing's happened. And if, and if anything, this is the one development that's happened recently that's so exciting, is there for a long time there was a push to, for the individual states to be able to defend themselves. And the federal government did not want this, want this because it would end the game, right? So now it's happened, and now states are forming individual defense forces to protect themselves. So if anything... Uh, it's that's encouraging, but what what's happened is so devastating because what started in the north moved down into the middle, and now it's down into the south, and there's no sanction, and so maybe even that's what needs to happen because the Christians in the south feel safe and protected, and now the attacks are moving down there, uh, but it's of such supreme importance because you can't imagine what will happen. You know, you can only push people so long, and and. Um, Nigeria is fairly evenly divided, so you can only kill and uh, take assets away from so many people. And then what happens when you have a lot of young men that are extremely angry uh, and can be armed and are not working and have a grudge to settle? That's a recipe for civil war. And if Nigeria ever goes to civil war, it'll be devastating beyond what we've experienced. And it's, it's really the heart of Africa. So anyways, it's something to be avoided at all costs. Um, so, Imar, please uh, talk to us about your experience. First of all, if you could lay out the just broad case of Iraq over the last 20 years and, then, and get into the details, if you would, please. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. And uh, I, on behalf of uh, Mushtaq Matloub, Ammar Al-Qas, and Ammar Matloub, uh, I would like to express our gratitude to Mr. Majdi Khalil for his invitation and support to our association of uh, Christians without home. Uh, so that we could bring our voices and eventually the voices of our beloved brothers and sisters, persecuted ones. I would like to thank you all for this uh, moment, which we have prayed for a very long time. So here we are today. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I stand here before you not to give you a conventional speech, but to affirm and document a live testimony on behalf of those who lost their lives and those who are voiceless. While they have witnessed these tragic events, the events of the persecution of Christians of Iraq, which is continued till this moment, but this persecution is real. Yes, it is real. And is based solely on the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, which makes the life of his followers vulnerable and in constant danger. Even though Christians have no dispute disputation in the uh, political arena for power authority. Allow me to introduce myself now. My name is Aymar Rahima, a resettled refugee from Iraq, graduated from uh, University of Mosul, worked with US, US Army between the years of 2003 and 2004 as an interpreter, linguist. My pleasure. I was about to get kidnapped, but uh, guess what? God saved me in a miracle, and a real miracle. Fled to Syria, and three months later, my dad, who was in Iraq, was abducted. The terrorist asked for my return in order to preserve the life of my dad. Probably someone will say, um, your dad got kidnapped because of your type of work. But in reality, this is not what it seems to be. Because while my dad was in a hostage, they forced him to watch a video of one of, of our friends uh, who was also working an interpreter and he got uh, kidnapped by those uh, terrorists. And that guy, he said literally in the video, Yusuf, which is my dad's name, 
Yusuf and his friends preaches the gospel and talk, talks bad about Muslim clergies. I will, I will keep my, uh, my dad's story for later. I spent five years in Syria, two times participated in the High Electoral Commission for Iraqi elections outside the, co the country. In Syria, and with the help of a beloved hardworking Chaldean deacon named Leith Jojo, whom helped many Chaldeans financially and linguistically with their crisis, I got a job with him as a linguist for UNHCR and IOM. For many persecuted minorities, such as Christians, Mandais, which is Sobi Sabis, and even and open-minded Muslims, which I even considered as a minorities. During my job as a bilingual, I have witnessed a hundred of cases that were presented, which if I recall now, no eye would remain dry. I will quote from Viktor Frankl, a Jewish Austrian Holocaust survivor who was once asked if he hated the Nazis, whom took the lives of his beloved ones, where he replied, I quote, no, for there are two human races, a race of a decent man and a race of an indecent man. How can we promote our societies for better people? Who can do it and what will be the motif? The freedom theme is the, the answer, but where is it? I mean, where's the freedom? In Iraq, for instance, we have no freedom in the society, and I'm not saying something that I did not experience. For I've spent the last 20, I mean, I spent 24, seven years of age, and uh, uh, you are hearing and seeing a, vo a voice of a dead man talking and walking. I'll be today the voice of an Iraqi martyr, Bishop Paulus Farajraho, Father Raghid Ganni, Basman Yusuf Dawood, Wahid Han Aisho, and Ghassan Hassan, all of, all of the Chaldean Catholic Church. Father Bolus Iskander from Syriac Orthodox, Orthodox Church. Pardon me. Do we need more? I have 48 martyrs from one church, Syriac Catholic Church, with their priests in one day. On the top of that, many Christians converted from Islam are abused and rejected by their families. In addition, addition, they may be persecuted or even killed. Since 2003, till this moment, over 60 churches were destroyed or bombed. Over 1,200 people were killed, not to mention those who were kidnapped and forcibly deported. Priests, deacons, bishops, nuns, and Christians were targeted. Not only that, but whole churches many times were blown. Even the current Christian entities in the government are not working for the minorities, but for their own interest. And this is obvious. What's happening in Iraq nowadays and, are the, uh, and about the minorities specifically, Christians, are, are Christians doing okay? We always hear that, this. The answer of this question is no, they are not. And here's the statistics. The, ex the existence of Christians in Iraq and Middle East in general has reached at a very critical stages and has decreased to a very critical level. As mentioned by former British Foreign Secretary Jeremy Hunt, which points to the decline of Christianity percentage per presence from 20% to 2% in the past century. I mentioned Christianity in Iraq has dropped to 0.04%. With this being said, we will put forward our vision through the following points. I beg you to hear me well. We urgently need a trustworthy historical documentation process for those bloody events. The Christians Without Home Association is a voice for the voiceless, which is a group of families whom experienced this painful event. And Iraq and Arabic media is trying to buy, to bury this truth with false claims and misleading that attempts to fabricate false charges and evade moral responsibilities for, the, for that heinous crime by blaming it entirely on the United States. The undeniable truth is that the cause behind all of this is Islamic hate to speech. And um, the evidence is that such bloody events have repeatedly throughout history. Second, politically Iraq government are capitalizing on this issue of Islamic terrorism by giving terrorist group the space to exercise violence away from these governments. On another hand, governments exploit and force churches leaders to numb people's emotion. Three, 
the churches of all denominations in Iraq and Middle East have proven a complete failure in protecting Christians in the Middle East. Four, Christians in Iraq do not have a true independent political party that truly represent them. The suppress and separation from the culture, history, and heritage have already done the damage and needs time to heal. This is what we currently see from the chaos of parties claiming to represent the Christian's community, but they are implementing their greedy agenda to help cultural and political lobby, lectures, and encouraging young people should be initiated to start a new professional fields in defending the rights of our communities under the International Watch. These groups of young people can work with the church, but not under the church to preserve the Christian's presence and solve problems or send message abroad. The work should be collaborative. Five, regarding the aid sent by the West, it was insufficient, ineffective, and was misused many times by corrupted individuals, organizations. Only minority of the common citizens did benefit from it. Six, the Constitution might show minority right, but in reality, there is a strong radical discrimination against them and are in a contradiction with the Universal Declar Declaration of Human Rights. Seven and the last, the continuous escalation of hate speech and the threat of new massacre through social media platform up to this day reveals the seriousness of the situation, signaling a new wave of persecution. For this reason, we warn of the repercussions of these events on, my, on, on minorities in general and Christianity in particular. Finally, a misleading media, a fearful church, and physical terrorism are extreme, extremely dangerous factors to, this con to continually of Christian existence in the Middle East. What will make you believe that the minority is targeted, especially Christianity? Is that deportation not enough? Does statistics lie? The blood that was shed is not convincing? In my conclusion, I will refer to the following major root issue again for all of this. Sacredness of the hate speech, which is any person who differs from my religious belief are considered defiled, and they are called blasphemers, pigs, scums, etc. They are then exterminating becomes a holy duty and protect protection will not becoming a responsibility. Why we don't see this in a Western hemisphere? This is a, a rhetorical question. Beloved audience, if my speech is convincing experientially, statistically, and historically, but nothing is changed, then I sadly will give you a quote from the best book of life ever being given to humanity. As a great President Lincoln said about it once, and I quote, the best gift God has given to men, end of quote. And this book is the Bible. And from a book of Proverbs 21, 31, which says, whoever shuts his ears at the cry of the poor, he also will cry himself, but will not be heard. So please do not partake with others whom their hands being guilty with the blood of their brothers Abel which is shouting to God Almighty, those kind of people who call evil good and good evil, who turns darkness to light and light to darkness, who replace bitter with sweet and sweet with bitter, destruction to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight, says Book of Isaiah 520. Please reconsider this case before dismissing it. And if you can't help Iraqi Christians, at least do not minimize their case and help them to document their persecution officially closing. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, says Book of Hebrew 13.3. For the descendants of the heroic forefathers and founders of the land of the free and the home of the brave who made their case against two gigantic challenges, fear and slavery. Fear was defeated by faith and slavery with courage. Now it's your turn. Thank you. Hi, Mark. Thank you so much. Um, you guys have done great. The 10 minutes, you were right there. So. Oh, really? <laughs> I thought that was um, nice, yeah. Lindsay, are you still here? Um, I, I, we had a lot of issues. We were talking about security. Do we have a third guest? OK. And. They're going to be hidden, but they can hear us and we'll hear them. All right. 
Well, my friend, I don't even know your name, which is good because I might say it in, inadvertently, but we want to welcome uh, this guest from Sudan uh, with a fascinating story, fascinating history. So God bless you. Please tell us uh, about Sudan. Okay, it's, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Coptic Solidarity for inviting me. And it's a shame that I'm talking behind uh, glass or hidden space for security reasons. Just before I begin my speech, I kindly ask you to listen and understand the dire situation faced by the Sudanese population, particularly Christians, who are exper experiencing vandalism and violence at the hands of the rebel forces originating from neighboring countries. These forces, they're not Sudanese. These forces often chant religious phrases, such as, God is great. Yet their actions demonstrate a lack of true understanding of their faith. Shockingly, they treat human life as incredibly cheap, valuing it at no more than the cost of a mere two cents equivalent to the price of a bullet. I understand that I'm just one lucky person among millions who have managed to escape, but still have family members there, including my brother's family, who remains in, in a precarious situation because he has no other passport. It is unfortunate that I have to speak in hiding although I'm in the most powerful legislative area, but cannot be helped at the moment, separated by a partition, for my family and my own safety. The challenges and sacrifices me and many others face are significant, and it is important to shed light on these difficult circumstances. This was just something I had to say before I go into the main speech. In the name of the Father, the God, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Distinguished members of the United States Congress, I consider it a great privilege to address this distinguished gathering of legislators today. My purpose here is to draw your collective attention to an urgent matter that demands immediate action. As a proud taxpayer American citizen and a devout Christian Sudanese, I am compelled to share my first, my first hand account of the realities unfolding in Sudan, going beyond the realm of social media and bringing the true narrative to light. In a devastating turn of events, my entire family and I experienced a complete, I repeat, a complete loss of our life savings, businesses, and assets within the initial two weeks of the war, which commenced abruptly on the eve of Easter, April 16th, 2023, at precisely 8.30 a.m. <sighs> Prior to this, to this catastrophe, my various companies employed a total of 221 individuals, all of whom tragically found themselves unemployed within a mere half hour span. In summary, my business portfolio encompassed a range of enterprises, including pharmacies, limousine companies, medical buildings, hospital, health club facility, telecommunication services, beauty centers, body and mechanical workshops, rental apartments, as well as transportation services offered to other companies' staff, in addition to the fixed assets. To begin, it is important to note that the conflict at hand primarily involves the extreme Muslim brothers who are giving orders to the army soldiers and the Janjaweed rebel forces only. I repeat, it's just between those two forces and it's only for power. As you are aware, the Janjaweed rebel forces originate from neighboring countries. It is worth noting that 
While they do speak Arabic, their dialect and accent differ from the Sudanese Arabic, allowing one to discern their foreign origin. However, it is regrettable that all the Sudanese Christians and approximately 70% of the Sudanese population have become unintended victims, enduring the loss of their lives and assets. Compounding the situation, the absence of law enforcement authorities who have fled their posts, unfortunately, to safeguard their own lives, leaves the populace without any assistance. The Janjaweed rebel forces have taken control of police stations, fire stations, emergency posts, schools, all churches, I repeat, all churches, some mosques, hospitals, banks, clinics, residential buildings, houses, clubs, and embassies. Even our own embassy, the US embassy in Khartoum. Further exacerbating the dire circumstances. The Christian community in Sudan, <clears throat> although they are minorities, hold significant economic influence driving the country's economy without actively engaging in political pursuits. Their focus lies primarily on praying, trade, and business. I provided the earlier context just to illustrate why I stand before you today seeking to elucidate the events that befell me and my family. On the second day of the conflict, my brother's residence, which is next to our, uh, to our limo company headquarters and located a mere 50 meters away from a Janjaweed headquarters. The Janjaweed are the rebel forces. Encountered an unexpected encounter, a member of the Janjaweed approached his house, specifically seeking IV sets, as they were aware of our hospital and indicated in a high number of wounded soldiers in their ranks. In response, my brother conveyed that he did not possess any IV sets at his residence, as they were solely stocked in the hospital's storage. He suggested that the Janjaweed representative should visit the hospital instead, assuring them that they would find the required supplies there. The conversation took place around 7 p.m. while the Janjaweed member insisted in his proposal to provide shelter and requested my brother's assistance in retrieving the IV, the IV sets along with the accompanying drips. The following morning, an individual fully armed with heavy weaponry arrived and requested a limousine pickup from my company's fleet. Despite my brother informing him that he did not possess the office keys, the person persisted, demanding access. Eventually, he forcefully entered the premises by shooting down the door and accompanied my brother in searching for the key within the limo office. The individual loaded his heavy weaponry into the pickup truck and drove away without providing any form of identification. In an effort to prevent further vehicle theft, my brother returned to the office, retrieved spare keys, money, and important documents from the safe, and securely transported it to the main safe in his own residence. After a two hour interval, my brother decided to visit the office again to assess the situation, considering it had been previously attacked. To his astonishment, he discovered that the group had once again forcefully entered the premises, causing extensive damage to both the office and the safe. Without delay at that time, he returned to his residence and informed his wife and kids about the incident, prompting them to conceal themselves as if they were not present within their own home. 9 a.m. the next day, a group of 12 heavily armed Janjaweed individuals forcefully banged on his front door, 
Swiftly, he sought refuge, refuge behind the nearby wall, only to witness them shatter the door, just like they did in the office. Luckily, a bullet fired towards him struck the ceramic floor, causing it to ricochet off the wall beside him. Reacting swiftly, he gathered his family members and sought shelter behind the safety of a bed. Approximately five minutes later, the intruders uncovered their hiding spot and held them at gunpoint, compelling them to come out. They were then coerced into opening the safe while being told that their lives would be spared. The intruders made it clear that they only sought money, jewelry, and gold. As he approached to hand them the key, he discovered his house in utter disarray. To his dismay, one of the soldiers noticed my brother and callously grabbed two crosses that were hanging on the wall, intentionally crushing them under his boot. He uttered the derogatory term kafir, which means non-believer, or so said to Christians just by extreme Muslims, emphasizing, I emphasize that these chants were, are said by extreme Muslims. Emphasizing that this country, Sudan, belonged exclusively to Muslims. In his attempt to retrieve the safe keys, my brother realized that his house had been ransacked within those brief five minutes, making it impossible to locate the safe keys. The intruders reloading their weapons with a threatening presence insulate insinuated that his demise was imminent. However, my brother pleaded with them, urging them to spare his life and instead take the safe, promising that they could do as they pleased with its contents. He emphasized the presence of his family and his desire to raise his children. Moved by his plea, they spared his life and instructed him to return to his room and wait. During those tense 60 minutes, gunshots echoed through the house. Strongly, shortly, two soldiers emerged from the bathrooms unclosed, while another one approached my brother and shared distressing information. It was revealed that the assassins had intentions of sexually assaulting his wife. Realizing the imminent danger, he swiftly took hold of his wife's and son's hands without gathering any belongings and fled to seek refuge with their neighbors. Until today, till today, this time I'm talking, I'm giving this speech, the Janjaweed militants continue to occupy his home. In addition to the detailed account provided, all our Pharmacy outlets were targeted, with one being set ablaze and all of them being robbed. Furthermore, our fleet of limousine cars were stolen, all of them, and the telecommunications capital was stolen, forcefully entered into the workshop, resulting in extensive damage. Hospital being occupied till today. Not only did they vandalize the workshop, but they also stole the cars belonging to other customers. Is it not the appropriate moment for our great nation to take action and provide assistance to the struggling Sudanese nation? Although sanctions have been imposed on certain companies involved, their effectiveness is limited as most of these companies are currently non-functional or under the control of the Janjaweed. Furthermore, Russia's involvement and support, along with the neighboring countries engaged in business partnerships, present a challenge to the impact of these sanctions. It is important to note that the majority of the Sudanese people reject both 
both the Janjaweed and the army run by the extreme Muslim brothers. It's important to note that the rampant acts of theft, home invasions, ch church expulsions of bishops, the bishops have been expelled out of the churches, and killings are primarily carried out by the Janjaweed forces, while the army lacks power, lacks presence and influence in this current situation. The Sudanese population stands united in their opposition to both parties, seeking a better and more inclusive future for their nation. In conclusion, I implore the esteemed members of the Congress to heed the desperate pleas of the Sudanese people. Is it time for our great nation to extend a helping hand and take decisive action to alleviate their sufferings? We must consider targeted measures against the companies facilitating the violence, encourage dialogue and mediation between conflicting power, uh, parties. Although both refuse and both parties are rejected by the people and ensure the humanitarian aid reaches those in need. Let us not turn a blind eye to the plight of the Sudanese people, especially the persecuted Christian community they have nowhere to go but to a Christian country, as all the rest need visas, which are mainly offered to the majority, not minorities. Although we can make a difference and contribute to a brighter, more peaceful future for Sudan, last but not least, I am a US citizen and was investing in Sudan and lost literally everything. I need my people to get me back what has been taken by force from a US taxpayer, as this is my right, as stated in the Constitution. In conclusion, I want to emphasize the dear situation faced by Christians in Sudan. They are enduring immense suffering with limited options for refugee, particularly in Christian-friendly countries. Extreme factions within the Muslim community, not, not, representatives of all, not representative of all Muslims, exert control over neighboring countries and treat Christians as, as second-class citizens, as this has been going on for a long time. The cost of leaving Sudan for neighboring countries has skyrocketed, making it nearly impossible for people to escape. Tragically, many have lost their lives at the borders due to violence, lack of sources, and the harsh conditions. They have been laid to rest in makeshift locations, unable to receive proper religious services due to restricted access. Instead of risking the lives of our own troops later, and potential losses as we witnessed in Iraq. It would be beneficial to apprehend those publicly supporting ISIS in Sudan now. Let's extend a helping hand and provide hope to these displaced individuals who have contributed to the growth of the Gulf countries, but find themselves without a place to call home. May God bless and protect the USA. Thank you. Well, brother, thank you for that. Um, thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for your um, being willing to put yourself at risk to share the story of what's going on. And we feel sorry for, with you and just feel the pain of your loss. Um, I think we have time to move into a Q&A session. Do, uh, does anybody have questions? All right. OK.
what is the situation for refugees through violence in Sudan? Brother, do you have an answer to that? Brother from Sudan, are you still there? Yes, I am. Uh, uh, do, you, do you know anything about the situation of the, uh, for refugees? Is there, I know you had talked about that. Is there any relief for them, any avenue of escape? Oh, uh, most of the Sudanese, the Christian Sudanese, uh, they are of uh, Egyptian origin because they are Coptics. And what happens was they went to the UNHCR in order to register their names as refugees. But unfortunately, most of them, they have a dual nationality of an Egyptian passport but they have no connections with Egypt. It's just because of their ancestors, of their uh, grandparents. So the UNHCR refused to register them as refugees. And they are just stuck there. They don't know what to do. They have no work. They cannot go back. And they cannot leave. So it's, uh, nobody knows anything. What, what's going to come, the UNHCR said no way to register them as refugees. All right, thank you for sharing that. Um, Brother Rahima, what is the name of the terrorist group that abducted your father? As, as I remember, uh, it was prior to ISIS, their name was Al-Jihad wa Tawheed. Neat name, right? All right, any other questions? Uh, I'm sorry. All right. For Simi Sola, we know the UN State Department and other globalist elites blame the slaughter of Christians on climate change. That's a stretch. I get the angle. But um, do you get much pushback when you speak the truth about it? I think there's um, pushback specifically for from where? Um, so there's an angle saying, look, this is all really due to climate change, which is a bit of a stretch, but it goes into the herder farmer conflict and maybe the desertification. And um, so they need lands and they're, they're grabbing lands just because climate change is forcing them to. So do you get pushback when you say, hey, wait, wait a minute, this is a religious conflict uh, or whatever other angle you share? I think there's no, um, you know, the former government has not done enough to specifically um, call out what is happening. So it's, it's like a, a narrative, a dual narrative of this isn't happening. It's the fault of herdsmen. It's yeah. to bring confusion as to what is actually happening, that people are getting killed, there's persecution taking place. Um, for me, um, I grew up in Nigeria. Um, I, was, I was educated in the West. And so to be able to speak out, speak out on it is important to me because I don't want to feel like, oh, I'm here, I'm comfortable, I'm safe. Yeah. Um, when my people, this is happening. But all I can do is speak from personal experience, what has happened to me, and no one can argue that. It's not, a, it's not something I've read. Um, it's something that has touched my own life. So I haven't gotten specific pushback from speaking on it, but I have heard the false narratives yeah. that have been spread. Yeah, I, I touched on that in the beginning. Yeah. Uh, um, I often find myself in a position of uh, being a little abrasive in Washington on this issue because of speaking the truth. And like I said, the, the long running conversation, which is really starting to change and really has been changing, was again, the success of regimes that were ruling there, regardless of, of uh, their religion, would say these things. You know, this is a herder farmer conflict. This is guerrilla fighters. We can't get to them. We don't know where they are. It's all so complicated. Um, but it ignores a lot of things. And even when the conflict started in the North, they were going after Christians. They were going after all the, uh, 
you know, all that the missionaries had built, the hospitals, the schools, et cetera, those things, those facilities were being destroyed and targeted. Um, and there's a, a centuries-long history of conflict with a very small sea uh, between the Fulanis, the herders, and the Christians, who are the farmers. So the Fulanis have cattle, and they're nomadic, and they go all over the country. And so for centuries, you can't exactly, you know, control your, uh, your cows, and so they'll wander in and eat Christian farmers' crops. But there was, a, there was always a history and a way to deal with it. And so there was some frustration, but the Fulani would say, my gosh, we were so sorry, we damaged some of your crops. How can we, you know, make this right? And for centuries, that system worked. Well, at the turn of the century, arms were introduced and radicalized fighters from outside the area uh, came in. So most of the time, these attackers, they're not, they're not locals. These are outside fighters. They're coming in from Mali in different places. They're, um, they're armed Islamic terror groups, okay? It's a massive land grab. Uh, it's a slow-moving genocide. That's, that's the deal. That's the simple truth of it. And the reason it keeps going on, again, is because all the security services, from the police to the military to the intel agencies, are all controlled by Muslims. It doesn't matter what regime is in there. It doesn't matter what president is in there. So um, that's the Im that's the impolite truth of what's going on. Now, it, and it's been a, a heck of a, uh, of a situation just to get Washington to wake up to say, perhaps religion is playing a part in this. <laughs> so now we're there, and the state State Department is saying, you know what? I think religion's playing a part in this. They're still kind of a little slow on the uptake, but um, that's part of the deal, and that's pushback you get, and I I get pushback from my own staff even. Because it's the, if you stray too far outside of the accepted message in Washington, you know, you, you get pushback. Just that's the way it is with messaging and culture. Um, so anyways, I hope that's not too much detail and that's coming from me. But what is the main cause for the kidnapping in Nigeria? Thank you, Jeff, for speaking on behalf of Nigeria. That's not a narrative that is common. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people think oh, no, it's just internal fighting, it's herdsmen, but it's, it's, it's a religious issue. And I think it's power. Yeah. It's uh, to cause fear, to remove um, economic, the, the economic power of Christians. And um, if you have a whole group of people living in fear of, oh, I hope this doesn't happen, um, you know, I, I know every kidnapping case is not connected to um, terrorism, but there is a, you know, there's a growing fear amongst people, even my parents and um, my loved ones, of, of the cause. And I think, like you said, the land grabbing, yeah. um, the power, the, the dominance, um, it's all part of the network. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and there's also, there's usually a history where, you know, the terror groups are, are largely fu funded out of, out of the Gulf and from the Saudis, and they provide the seed money. But over time, these guys have to fend for themselves, and it usually goes to kidnapping. And, and so it's not all kidnapping is connected, but there's a very strong correlation because there's a rise in just general banditry and lawlessness, but at the same time, it's very connected to funding, uh, funding the fighting. So you always, anytime you see conflict or war, you want to follow the money, right? And then you're going to get to the bottom of it and see what's going on. So what else? Anything else? That's all you With the funding? You know, I'm not up to speed on that, but I would suggest, I would probably agree with you that they probably have stopped. If, if they're resorting to kidnapping now for funding, uh, they're probably on their own, and it's like, all right, you guys got to generate your own thing. So it's that's usually the genesis that comes from the Gulf, and then you have to develop your own funding. So, brother, if you if you allow me for yes. thirty seconds, I it just I I found this uh, important to know that while my dad was kidnapped, that's uh, just an encouragement for uh, any kidnapped person or or any persecuted Christians that they are in Egypt or Nigeria or Sudan or Iraq. Uh, actually, my, my dad is, is a hero, not only in my eyes, but in, for 
the, in the eyes of many, because when while he was in in, uh, in a hostage, they uh, they took his his ring and they said, "Yalla, qul uh, shahada," say say the witnessing, the two witnessing, like "Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah." We kemmel. He he did not. He said, "I'm a Christian. I I prefer to die like this." And then they start start cussing him. And one of them, he said, "You uh, dog, you, you have to go to your to stand up before your God, purified. So say the shahada." And that my dad refused, and and uh, you know they start negotiating with him since he read he read the uh, Quran and he read the Bible, so he knows what. So he start debating debating with them, and it was funny then when he when he told us that he they he start they took him to a guy. His name is the judge. And that the judge, he said, okay, be prepared to cut, you know, to cut your throat with a, with a sword. So he said, where's your sword? You don't have it. So he said, no, okay, we, we, are, use, we are using small knives, uh, you know, sharp knives instead because we don't have a sword. So then my dad started, you know, going back and forth, uh, debating with them. And then at the end, they became his friend. But not a friend, like, but they said, okay, pay the ransom and we're going to release you because he said, Aymar is not in the country, he's in Syria, and, and, and he was afraid for me to go back. And uh, so that's, I think that was important to say that my, my dad's faith is, and, and by, the, by the way, all the family, they are here in the U.S., and my dad, he, although he was kidnapped, abducted, he, he went to northern of Mosul City after that, and he remained in a, in a village named al Qush. And we are originally from al Qush. Uh, so uh, he remained there, and and when when we 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 begged him literally, we said, Dad, come come to go, just go to any host country, to Syria or Turkey, so we you can come as a. He said, No, I'm not gonna leave in Iraq. If the if they will take me, if the U.S. will take me from from Iraq, I will fly. And guess what? That what happened. Hmm. Mm. Thank you for sharing that, and praise God, your father escaped and is alive. So, Copic Solidarity, thank you. God bless you all, and uh, we're on to the next session.